Hi everyone, uh, welcome to the second day of the Columbia River Basin Hunters Meridian uh, team meeting. My name is Stephen Phillips with the Pacific States Marine Fisheries Commission. Uh, you can find all of the information on uh, the CRB team at westernaas.org uh, and you go to the coordination tab and then drop down to regional and you'll see the information there. Uh, this broadcast will be recorded and we'll put that recording up on the site. I want to thank Fish and Wildlife Service, Portland and Denver offices and the Bonneville Power Administration for funding this event. And I think that's it. We'll turn it over to Leah. Leah, take it away. Great. Good morning, everybody. Um, nice to see all of you guys coming back as people are um, joining the webinar. We're kind of just moving slowly to allow folks to to get online here so um much like uh you know yesterday if you have specific questions um you can put those in the question box or the chat whatever is um kind of visible to you as a participant here and i will do my best to get to you as time permits um and same with the hand raising sometimes i um it's probably easier to put your question in the question box and box and then i can unmute you if if that is easier so um, this morning we are going to hear from <clears throat> some folks on some rapid response um, efforts. So Lisa will be talking to us in a moment, and then we're going to spend some time discussing the, the national moss ball incident and then go into some legislative updates and Northern Pike and um, a few partner updates we weren't able to fit in yesterday. So um, without further ado, I guess I will have Lisa Debrecaer with Creative Resource Strategies. is going to be talking about the ESA manual um, and working with NOAA uh, this go around. You are probably familiar with the CRB DIRT website. So Lisa. Thanks so much, Leah, and uh, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining this morning. Um, I wanted to start off just by taking all of you back a number of years um, when we started the first tabletop uh, rapid response exercise in Vancouver, Washington. Um, primarily with the states of Oregon and Washington, but in many respects, the entire CRB was represented as well. Um, and at that time, you know, we sort of navigated the complex topic of how would we ultimately uh, affect a response to, to Dracinids in the Columbia River Basin. Um, and that to do so, after following through with the Fish and Wildlife Service and a series of steps determined that it would most likely be by emergency response and that any other way of getting approval to take an action likely wouldn't occur other than through the emergency response approach. And so using that uh, frame of mind, I guess, over the last number of years, we began working with the Fish and Wildlife uh, Service to really describe what the process and steps would be. And so Leah, if you would show the CRB DIRT website, that would be great. Um, and, and we started walking through all those steps of what the responses would be, what are the likely chemical and mechanical effects um, on different types of threatened and endangered species in the Columbia River Basin, that sort of thing. And so what became of all those efforts up until about a year and a half ago is the crbdirt.com website. Um, and it was our way of presenting to all of you the results of working with the Fish and Wildlife Service, the approved steps that we would take, um, the emergency response pieces of it, that sort of thing. And as all of you know, one of the biggest hiccups to this whole approach is that it did not include um, NOAA trust species or salmonids, which are pretty important in the Columbia River Basin. They're important to the economy, the environment, the people that live there, tribes. And so doing it with only the Fish and Wildlife Service and only with Fish and Wildlife Service trust species wouldn't really affect the kind of response that in approvals that we were hoping to have should we need to engage in a dracinid response. And so Stephen and I have worked hard over the last year and a half um, to engage with Nancy Munn and the National Marine Fisheries Service 
to incorporate uh, NOAA trust species. And so, Leah, if you'll go to the ESA consultation um, menu tab, and from where I'm at, I'm going to probably be seconds, if not minutes, behind you with the response. So I'm just going to assume you're following through with uh, with how I'm guiding you. So under ESA consultation, if you'll go to list of species and critical habitats, that's awesome. Um, none of these have changed since we built the website primarily focused on uh, Fish and Wildlife Service trust species. And so our goal then was to complete the website and update it incorporating all of, um, especially the fish species uh, as it relates to federally and endangered. So Leah, if you'll go to potential effects chemical methods under the ESA consultation tab, chemical methods, and then if you'll scroll down uh, all the way to the fish section once that pops up. Um, and when you do that, it's gonna, it's gonna take you to, um, the fish species and there's an introduction on, in general terms about the toxicity of potash to fish, the toxicity of earth tech to fish, and the toxicity of equinox to fish. And then it starts scrolling through some species like, um, bull trout and Kootenai River white sturgeon, Lahontan cutthroat trout, and short-nosed suckers, as well as pallid sturgeon. And then we get to what we just recently added. And so what we did, if you'll, if you'll go to the space, just keep scrolling, Leah, till you get to Chinook salmon. So what we did is we did a literature review uh, on all of the salmon species, their specific vulnerabilities, so we looked at each of the recovery plans for salmon in the Columbia River Basin, and we pulled from them their specific vulnerabilities. We also described some potential effects on key stages, potential effects on critical habitats, and some species-specific best management practices. So I would highly encourage each of the states to look through these sections. It's really important to understand what the species-specific BMPs are for not only each of the species, but for any of their specific ESUs as well. And so I won't continue to ask you to scroll, Leah, but these, these just continue on. There's pages of it um, that deal with Chinook, uh, Chum, Coho Salmon, Sockeye Salmon. We get into the Snake River ESUs and also steelhead, each of the DPSs for steelhead as well. Um, so you guys can look at these on your own time. Um, and you'll see as well, Leah, if you'll go to um, best management practices under the ESA consultation tab. We've also updated the best management practices um, to ensure that we've incorporated any specific BMPs for the salmonid species salmon and steelhead uh, in the CRB. They're now in this section as well. In terms of the reference materials, which is the last uh, menu tab to the right, we've also updated uh, all of the acronyms, the glossary, and the literature cited for the recent literature review. The last piece that we did to update the CRB DIRT website and the, the ESA manual as well, um, is that we did update all of the literature. We did incorporate some new science from the last three years um, relative to chemical and mechanical effects on uh, non-NOAA uh, trust species. So all of the species that were included in the original CRB DIRT website and ESA manual, we've updated that literature to ensure that we have the latest science on chemical and mechanical effects. So what is the next step in the process? Um, it, it's been determined that it's probably never going to be likely, at least in the near term, um, that we're going to get a programmatic uh, for what we're looking for relative to a dracinid response. And so because it's going to be an emergency action, um, we just need to stay focused on making sure we've got all of the latest updated information on chemical and mechanical effects, go through the process that we described and acted out with the Fish and Wildlife Service at our last 
uh, rapid response exercise. And we are awaiting a letter from the National Marine Fisheries Service to Stephen in Pacific States Marine Fisheries Commission, which basically acknowledges um, that we did this sort of exercise that we've walked through um, all of the chemical and mechanical effects. We've got the latest science. We've described what the best management practices are that will be implemented to consider salmon and steelhead when a response is taken, and that the, if the National Marine Fisheries Service is supportive of this approach uh, and will engage with us in that emergency response. Um, so that said, Stephen, I'll turn it over to you for any additional comments, and if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer. No, great. Thanks, Lisa. Um, want to thank the National Marine Fisheries Service and Nancy Mon for helping out on this. Uh, we'll continue to work with all the federal agencies on everything surrounding permitting so that in the event of an infestation that we can get chemicals in the water. I do believe at this time with the emergency actions that we could we could get chemicals in the water quickly. Um, so that's that's the good news. Um, so I'll open it up to any other questions. If you have a question um, about this project for Lisa or Stephen, go ahead and put that in the question box. Um, we can address. Okay, let's see here. Oh, okay, Blaine, um, if you want to access the crbdirt.com website, you do have to put www in front of it. I have found that funny glitch for myself. If you don't put www, some, it may not go there. But if you put www.crbdirt.com, you should arrive at this location <laughs> that's showing on my screen. <laughs> Yeah, and Lee, I'll get that glitch corrected too. We'll we'll take care of that in the next week or so. I know it's funny. Like most of the time, you just put in what you want to find now, but I don't know. <laughs> it's this one is different. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, Lisa, it looks like you're off the hook. I don't see any more comments on this. Okay, well, thank you, Lisa, for joining us on the road <laughs> to present on this. <laughs> Appreciate it. You bet, have a great one. Okay. All right, so let's see. Next on our agenda, we were to have Miss Susan Pasco um, talking about the National Moss Ball um, incident that occurred. Um, I cannot see that Susan has joined. So, um, assuming, let's see, let me look at the chat here. Okay, so she was on at 9.30. Right, we're a little ahead of schedule. Um, I guess you and I can, we can jump to the uh, the CRB perspective and then have her chat. I don't know, what do you think? Um, yeah, let's do that. Yeah, I just have, she hasn't joined the webinar. We can't okay. make her talk, we can't make her talk. <laughs> Unless Susan, I do see an attendee that doesn't have a name. If that happens to be you, Susan, just type a question in and I can. Uh, yeah, we got Hillary. Hillary's asking a question on oh, whether okay. she wants to text. Yeah, Hillary should text um, Susan. Thank you, Hillary. And I've, um, and Leah just for logistics, I, I'm signed in in like three different 
Oh, okay. Because I don't know if things are going to crash here or not, so I'm just I'm okay. all backed up. Triple backed up. Okay. Um, well, so how about we talk about the the CRB effort related to the MOS file then until we get Susan okay. online? Can you bring the document up? Yes. And is Teresa there? So you want to unmute her? Yep. Yep. Teresa's brought over. Okay. All right. You should see the month's fall report now, Stephen. Yep. Got it. Great. Okay. Um, so. As many of you know, in late February, early March, we were taken by uh, it was a big surprise when we heard from uh, Seattle Pet Store that the that report that went into USGS um, of potential mussels in um, aquarium moss balls. Um, this, you know, we've been preparing for an invasion via watercraft. Um, and they flew over our heads. Um, so, oh, also, I got to put my mask on. Hang on. Yeah. Um, well, this so, we good. activated the Columbia River Basin Rapid Response Plan. And I'm uh, turning my camera on here. So, this. <laughs> Quagga D sent me this. It's a, yes, it's a moss ball mask. Isn't that cool? Um, so once this happened, it was kind of chaos, as everybody remembers, in the first uh, 24 to 72 hours. What we did was, um, in discussions with Teresa and then also with Eric Anderson, because the action, um, excuse, there's going to be some banging here. The garbage is here. And there we go. Um, we decided it was time, because these things could possibly be uh, throughout the Columbia River Basin um, to activate the plan. Um, so in doing that, what that means is um, underneath the uh, multi-agency coordinating group, which are the signatories to the plan, which is uh, province of British Columbia, uh, the four Columbia River Basin states, National Marine Fisheries Service, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and Columbia River Intertribal uh, Fish Commission. What we um, what we do is initially we contact the staff contacts, many of whom are on the line right now, which would be an AIS coordinator, for example, Martina Beck in British Columbia, et cetera. And then we uh, discuss: Do we need to activate the directors of the agencies? Um, right now, or should we staff, brief them, pull a call together of staff, and then figure out what we're going to do? And so that's that's what we did. Um, we went with the staff option, not the full MAC option, thinking later that, yeah, we probably would bring in all of uh, the, the director level people uh, when and if necessary. It turned out we didn't need to do that, but um, with the chain of command, all of the staffers kept uh, their supervisors up to date. And obviously, this thing then went big and went national, and everybody knew about it. So, um, as we went along, we added by request the state of California and then the state of Wyoming also jumped in. And we were very fortunate to have great participation from law enforcement, um, not only in Washington State with Captain Eric Anderson who uh, at the beginning was critical to this, but also uh, US Fish and Wildlife Service enforcement. Um, we had uh, several officers join us and that was great. Um, so I think most of you kind of followed along how this went and then Susan, will she can discuss all, all the activities they had at the national level. Um, again, we never have run into anything like this, um, this vector, it was so weird. Um, and at the beginning, we didn't know, oh my God, is this, you know, the beginning of muscles all over, you know, a, a pathway for introduction broadly 
across North America. It looks like it turned out it didn't. That's not going to be what happened. Um, and we're obviously all still watching and the states are aware as the feds. So <clears throat> when we do our rapid response exercises, there's a beginning and an end. And then at the end, we do an after action report. Well, we can't put the word after yet in this mothball incident action report because there's probably still some mothballs out there with muscles in them. So we're just calling it an action report. Um, and this does include a, a timeline. So Leah, go ahead and scroll down there. And uh, this is close to being finalized. And I know that for our group, anyway, the Columbia River Basin team folks that worked on this, um, the summary and uh, key issues and recommendations and suggestions um, are important. Um, and one being, and this is on the legislative side, there's there's a bill right now in Congress by uh, Marco Rubio, and I'll talk about that a little bit, um, on amending the Lacey Act regarding interstate transport. And it probably would have been helpful if the full Lacey Act from years ago had been in effect, but it got modified by the reptile keepers lawsuit. But anyway, um, so there we have, that's the table of contents and we come down and we do have a timeline that Teresa did. And I'll let Teresa, why don't you jump in here and just talk a little bit about how you put that timeline together. All right, I think I'm unmuted now. Um, so I worked really just from emails and um, tried to kind of summarize the timeline and um, you know as as the incident was unfolding from the initial kind of notification from USGS and then as we kind of realized within the basin that it wasn't just one store in Seattle and um, you know WDFW was very quick to respond with um, law enforcement on the ground and then you know, as the message was getting shared through our state AIS coordinators and, and really just as this kind of, you know, the, the word got out about mothballs with zebra mussels, I think it, it quickly um, became just more than just a regional issue, but then um, international as we worked with um, Canada and seeing the distribution. Um, really it, it quickly escalated from you know just something in the Columbia River Basin to something much bigger and um, yeah so the timeline again is is really just kind of trying to summarize you know as things were unfolding in the Columbia River Basin um, and I appreciate everyone's input on this timeline so thank you all for contributing to this Thanks, Teresa. So, um, yeah, this is Leah. I The only other thing I would just to add to this document for folks. So this was circulated to what, you know, was the or is the Columbia Basin Multi-Agency Coordination Group. So that's what helped um, create and finalize this document. We're very close to, um, I guess, uh, sharing this on the uh, westernais.org website. Um, but really, we tried to go through, as you know, as Stephen mentioned, um, at the end of an exercise, um, we would, you know, have an after-action report, and certainly at the end of an incident, we would want to have a report. So, um, you know, if we look at the table of contents, we really tried to identify those areas that, um, you know, where different actions would be helpful. And, you know, obviously in the real world, this allowed us to see it was a bit, you know, a big a, a learning um, situation and um, things became obvious of how um, how to do things um, to streamline a process to improve a process. So we really tried to outline the actions that were taken and ways to um, improve upon things um, in the future. So um, so look for that soon. I anticipate here in the next, I don't know, couple of weeks, it should be all completed and ready to go. 
So, and so yeah, again, so this is Teresa, just to highlight that the scope of this is really just focused on our Columbia River Basin response. And um, yeah, that, that there's, you know, we, we didn't want to get ahead of any kind of reporting or summaries that would be coming from a the larger scale kind of national national scope. Correct, but it certainly loops into, yeah, all the players are in here that <laughs> even on that national scale to a certain degree. So, um, so yeah, are there any questions about um, this document or the process that took place within the Columbia Basin related to the Moss Ball incident? Let's see. Okay, let's see. Hold on a second, Nick. I will unmute you. Okay. Go ahead, Nick, with your question. Yeah, thanks, Lee. And it's it's probably more of a comment just with the, the whole Moss Ball incident and how that unfolded. You know, there is a lot of stuff going on in Idaho and that response, you know, unfolding. But at the same time, there's just several layers of coordination and information sharing within this group and others that, that help provide crucial information that we needed here to get product off the shelves. I mean, even as far as like pictures of labels and specific SKUs on what to remove and what to look for. And that was just so helpful. So kudos to the group and everybody that was involved you know, even within those initial 24 hours to get that done. So, thank you. Agreed, Nick. It took a lot of conversations <laughs> to, to work on this. Um, okay, let's see. Quagga D, I believe you're trying to share a link to the purchasing your own mask, I think. So I'll try to put that in the chat for everybody to see here in a second. Um, thank you, Rayola says, Jacobson says, good work to all for responding so quickly and working together so well. Thank you, Rayola. Any other questions or comments? Okay, so um, like we said, this will this document will be available soon for folks to access and um, if you have questions after you take a look at it, please feel free to reach out to Stephen, Teresa, myself. Um, yes. Okay. Well, seeing no more questions, and I know we have gotten Susan on the line here. So, Susan, oh. I have unmuted you. Great. Thank you. And I'm going to find your PowerPoint and put it up for you. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Because I was not seeing a share screen option. So, yep. Let me just. Okay. So, I do have your PowerPoint pulled up. If you want to, and I can advance it for you. Great. We're all set then? Yes. Okay, super. Well, thank you everyone uh, for the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, I believe my uh, role here is just to give the overview of what really happened uh, at the national federal level. Um, and I'll go over some of the key events um, as the situation with boss balls continues to, to go on. Uh, so go ahead and advance the next slide. Perfect. All right. Um, so just to backtrack, I know many of you in the call probably have been immersed with this issue and are very familiar, uh, but just in case there is someone out there who's not really familiar with what we're talking about when we say moss balls, um, just want to go explain real briefly exactly what we're talking about. Uh, so the ones that were involved in this specific response were the Maribel moss balls. A um, little bit confusing because this is actually not a moss at all. This is actually a green algae. Um, pretty much it's densely, densely packed into a ball that's about two to five inches in diameter. 
Um, fun fact, uh, this plant is called Marimo uh, by a Japanese botanist because Mary means a bouncy play ball and Mo is a generic term for plants that grow in water. Um, so this particular moss ball commonly sold home aquariums, terrariums, water gardens. Um, before this whole situation um, unveiled itself, uh, you could purchase these pretty much in every state except for Hawaii through national retail chains, small independent retailers, and online marketplaces. So very widely sold. Um, the species itself comes from Europe, um, mostly in areas that were previously covered by glaciers, um, also been found in several places in Japan. Uh, they can be native to North America as well as Australia, but a bit more rare in those areas. Um, and also very important to emphasize that this moss ball, the algae itself, does not have a history of invasiveness. Um, some of the confusion around moss balls is that the Marimo moss ball is not the only one out there for sale. Um, you're also going to see moss balls that are actually made of a true moss ball, such as a Java moss. Um, so right now when we talk about Java moss, we are not aware of any zebra mussel or any invasive species risk concern with the true moss balls. Um, so this one is one that you probably will still see sold in pet stores and other retailers. Um, and another one out there is an artificial moss ball, um, exactly what it sounds like. It's pretty much a plastic ball covered in felt. Um, so again, this is one you probably still see out there being sold because it really will not have a risk of transporting zebra mussels or any other invasive. So the concern with these moss balls, and I'm again, just speaking about the Maribel moss ball. Um, so this originally started on March 2nd. Uh, US Geological Survey confirmed a report of zebra mussels that came attached and inside moss balls. Uh, that initial report did come from a Petco store in Seattle. And I, I don't think I need to spend too much time uh, with this audience telling them why this was a significant concern to us, um, given just the evasiveness of the zebra mussel um, and finding them in this pathway caused um, quite a bit of alarm bells to go off, I think, around the nation. Um, so obviously our concern here is that um, those mussels that were carried by the moss ball could be escaped or released into a natural waterway. Um, even though we have them, as the map shows here, in numerous waterways in the United States, um, obviously Columbia River Basin, many other still infested waterways throughout the United States that are going to need continued protection. Okay, so what is it about the moss balls? Why are we talking about it? Why is this such an atypical challenge? Um, so a few things here is one, um, it actually wasn't a zebra mussel response. It was a moss ball response as a plant commodity. Um, moss balls themselves, they do come in, they're inspected under US uh, Department of Agriculture Authority as part of the Plant Protection Act. Um, so the USDA will conduct their phytosanitary inspections on the plants to detect any plant pest, um, which is what they do for the moss balls. However, because zebra mussels are not a plant pest, um, they're not included in this authority. Um, so this really was why it was not on kind of their watch list or something they're actively searching for as they were inspecting uh, moss balls and other plants that come into the United States. Um, another kind of atypical challenge to this is this is very widely dispersed response. Um, usually when we talk about rapid response, we're talking about it maybe in one water body, one basin, you know, certainly just at the state level at the most. Um, but given that this one really rose to a national response, um, it has been currently reported in about 46 states, last time I counted. Um, and the last one is uh, this was an active law enforcement investigation on top of a rapid response. Um, so again, zebra mussels, they are covered under the Lacey Act, is something that is prohibited into the United States, but that is not going to prohibit interstate transportation, in, I'm sorry, interstate transportation. Um, so we do have several states that do have restrictions on the possession, use, and sale of zebra mussels. So there really did need to have be not only an investigation, but a lot of coordination needed to occur between the federal and state law levels. Okay. Um, when we originally started responding to moss balls, um, right from the get-go, we pretty much established that we needed to have two primary management objectives. Um, the first one here is simply to stop the importation of zebra mussel contaminated moss ball products into the United States. And second, to make sure that any that were already in the U.S. supply chain 
were being found and properly disposed of. Okay. Um, before I go into kind of the details for how we tackle those two objectives, um, here is just kind of an overview of the timeline of just some of the activities that occurred. Uh, so the timeline we have here starts on February 25th, um, and that is when Petco first contacted USGS uh, with you know, some information that they were seeing zebra mussels come in. Um, and then your timeline's going to go down and over, um, and it does on this timeline end on April 27th. Um, but just emphasizing that a lot of these activities here are still continuing to present day. Um, and I don't have time to really go into detail about every single one of them, um, but I'm just going to go over some of the highlights on my next few slides. All right, so starting with some of the examples of some of the federal action that occurred. Uh, so from the very beginning, uh, federal agencies began to meet on a very regular basis. We're still meeting on average about twice a week. Um, some of the key players in this meeting were the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, U.S. Department of Agriculture, Customs and Border Protection, U.S. Geological Survey. Um, so under these, I have some of the key activities that occurred. Um, I did assign a lead to each of one of the of these actions to a specific agency, uh, but I do want to emphasize that everything done really was highly collaborative. We are meeting on a regular basis to share information and get input from each other as we move forward. Um, so just starting with uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and some of the activities the agency led. Um, I already mentioned that this was an active law enforcement investigation. Uh, so Fish and Wildlife Service continued to work with state law enforcement officials um, and continue to conduct and get the information they need to keep this an ongoing investigation. Um, one of the earlier activities the Fish and Wildlife did is we did put a website on up very quickly to just describe the situation and get the information out there. Um, that website is being continuously updated, so it's kind of our go-to if people do have questions about what the current status of the response is or just want some general information about moss balls. We also do have a protocol on there, which is our destroy, dispose, and drain. Uh, this is put out there for anyone who has purchased a general, who has purchased a moss ball um, so that they know proper ways to not only dispose of the moss ball, but any procedures that they would need to decontaminate their home aquarium system or water garden. Um, we also put out two fairly comprehensive question and answer statements. Um, so again, these were put out and distributed to our state partners, and we also kept information up on the website, just again to kind of get the details of what was going on at the federal level. Um, we also had a lot of email traffic, as you can imagine, with a lot of different questions coming in. Um, so we were very diligent to try and make note of any question that we were receiving from the state or from the industry or from the public, and did try our best to provide an answer to each one of those questions that we received within those documents. Um, on my next couple of slides here, I'll go into some detail about the industry, but this is something we worked with very hard to make sure that we are working with industry to come up with solutions to really make sure that we were controlling anything that was in the supply chain. And the other one that's ongoing here is we are working to secure eDNA technology so that we can use it for incoming moss ball um, inspections um, that are being shipped into the United States. Um, as far as the U.S. Department of Agriculture, um, again, they are working very closely with the Fish and Wildlife Service to help intercept any zebra mussels at their plant inspection stations. I'll go into a little bit more detail here on that in the later slide. Um, they're also working very closely with e-commerce platforms such as Amazon, Etsy, um, to make sure that any online sales are also being restricted. U.S. Custom and Border Protection, um, they are targeting certain international shipments um, to make sure that they are um, being intercepted, um, specifically ones that do not meet U.S. entry requirements, such as they are missing the proper permit and things like that. Um, let's see here. And then they have also been working very closely with the states to conduct both trace back and trace forward efforts um, so that we really can understand exactly what is the scope of the moss balls and where they're being sold. 
Um, and last but not least, um, U.S. Geological Survey remains a key player. Um, they do continue to maintain records within their NAS database. They have off of offered to provide assistance with any uh, specimens of moss balls to see what else may be potentially living within moss balls. And they also have been very key to help us get that eDNIC technology uh, for the inspections. All right, um, so going back to the industry, as I mentioned, they have been a key player from the beginning. Uh, we have been working very closely uh, with the Pet Industry Joint Advisory Council, um, as PJAC, as you may know them. Um, right from the beginning, they did put out an industry alert on March 5th, um, simply to notify the industry of our concerns and to help them develop some decontamination protocols. Um, however, very early on, we also realized that moss balls were not just being sold in pet stores. It was a much broader audience as we were seeing them sold in nurseries, um, even grocery stores. Um, and a lot of them were being uh, sold not for use in aquariums, but within water gardens. Um, so we also worked with PJAC to develop protocols that were specific to help people who did have them in water gardens know how to properly dispose and decontaminate. Um, also in the industry alert that they put out, um, PJAC did re recommend a moratorium on moss balls. Um, they, how they worded it was to place a moratorium in the importation, purchase, and sale of all moss balls until a method of testing and treatment can be established to assure a clean trade. Um, so again, we thought this was an extremely important statement to come from PJAC um, and has really been helpful um, to make sure that we have been able to restrict the sales until we really do understand the scope of this problem and more importantly, can make sure that we can ensure a clean trade and get those decontamination protocols in place. Um, some of the large pet stores have also been extremely cooperative and helpful during this response. Um, Petco, PetSmart, um, you may recall that they put out recalls almost immediately um, and even offered pets, I'm sorry, customers to return moss balls to the pet stores. They also put out customer alerts so that everyone was aware of the issue and pointed them to that Fish and Wildlife website where you could find information for how to dispose of them. And they've also been extremely supportive of allowing law enforcement officials to come in, inspect moss balls, get what they need for evidence. Um, which has been key as this response moves forward. All right, a few more examples of industry action. Um, I mentioned again, not just sold in pet stores. We also are seeing them in grocery stores as well. Um, for example, the Safeway in Alaska, um, we're selling them in some of their terrariums within kind of their garden floral department. Uh, so working with the CAO of those companies to make sure those are being removed from shelves. Um, again, they are being marketing for nurseries and water garden use. So we also brought in American Fort, who put out a similar industry alert as PJAC did um, to really urge retailers not to sell moss balls um, and also to take action to safely destroy them. Um, and again, I already mentioned that USDA has been working very actively with online marketplaces. So they are currently looking for mussels that are being sold. Um, any that are being sold from a foreign IP address are being removed. Okay, some examples of the state action. Um, so we do know that there have been several quarantines throughout state uh, since the beginning, such as from Wyoming, Alaska, um, Arizona. Um, this has been really helpful, especially as we continue to work with industry to actually say that they are being prohibited being sold right now really has been a good talking point to really emphasize the importance of this issue. Um, again, working with the states to make sure that any regulations they have are being uh, enforced. Um, states have also been extremely helpful to help us gather that information for the contact tracing. So we really do know what's coming in from where, where it goes from, those shipments and who's selling it. Um, so again, that information continues to be compiled and used by our law enforcement agents. Um, and also, you know, just states have been key to really facilitating that communication. I think one benefit that really has come out of this, uh, this response here is just uh, getting to know and getting those connections made between enforcement and invasive species staffing. Um, they got very familiar with each other very quickly and have been great at really keep that communication and that open flow of information. 
All right, just to kind of uh, summarize, you know, where we were and where we are now, um, here's a slide that really shows how operations with mothballs have changed uh, since we did become aware of the contamination with zebra mussels. Um, so the first line here, as I already mentioned, that we are seeing more quarantine and more states prohibiting the sale. Um, previously, it was only Hawaii that it did not allow mothballs in their state. Um, since that time, we've added several other states uh, to that list. Um, as far as importation, um, pre-mossball um, zebra mussels, uh, mossballs only required a phytosanitary certificate um, to get entry into the United States. Um, from there, they were referred to a USDA plant inspection uh, where they'd be inspected, checked for plant pest only, um, and then cleared and allowed for sale. Um, also, um, before the zebra mussel incident, um, basically anything that was less than 12 moss balls um, was not being inspected. Um, however, now we are inspecting every single, no matter one of the, no matter the number of the shipment. Um, and now, in addition to just going to the plant inspection station um, for plant pest, all moss balls after that inspection are now being referred to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, um, who will inspect it for wildlife, zebra mussels, and other potential invasives. Um, another change in operation is USDA is currently restricting all moss ball imports only to Los Angeles and JFK. Um, those two are chosen simply because they are the largest facilities. They allow a lot more flexibility um, for the timing of inspections to occur. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, one of the things we are actively working on is to try to get that eDNA, te eDNA technology to test any mothball shipments uh, to ensure that zebra mussels are not a hitchhiking contaminant. Um, so right now we are looking to secure those kits. Um, get them to the inspection stations and to train uh, the law enforcement inspectors on how to use that technology. And lastly, um, one of the biggest changes is that if uh, zebra mussel contamination is detected in any mothball shipment, uh, we will take custody of that shipment and work with the importer for options for either re-exporting it back to them or destroying it. All right. Um, and finally here, as I mentioned, a lot of those efforts are still ongoing um, as we continue to kind of navigate and work towards getting that clean trade established. Um, so we do continue to work with industry to help make that happen. We're also continuing to monitor any e-commerce sites to make sure there are no additional listings that could come into the United States. Um, we're also kind of getting our heads around, you know, where do we go next? What are we learning from this? So if we do get a similar situation in the future, how are we going to handle that? Uh, so right now we are considering uh, two studies um, and two reports to come out of this report, I'm sorry, out of this response at the federal level. Um, the first one is we're proposing a study of the laws and regulations of states to identify best practices uh, regarding authorities to prohibit sales, quarantine shipments, and other management actions. Um, and the second one is, you know, pretty much what you did at the Columbia Reed Basin, just more of the national level, getting that actor action report and that hot wash, um, because we do think it's really important to evaluate, you know, what we did, the timeliness of it, how effective it was, um, really just really help us improve our AIS prevention measures and make sure that we are better respond, better able to respond if something like this in nature ever does happen again. And I think that's all I have for now, but I am certainly willing to uh, take any questions or uh, I know I gave a lot of information so I could also provide any more detail about any of those actions. Excellent, Susan, thank you so much. Um, please put your questions into the box there for Susan and we can unmute to field those. Um, so Susan, I saw that special email address that was mossball underscore. Oh, yes. Is, okay. How long will the Fish and Wildlife Service be maintaining that? What's Show, show, maybe show that up close again. Oh, sure. <laughs> I mean, I need to. I'm sorry, I should have pointed that out. Um, yes, 
Um, so rather than give a specific individual, um, since we are all being kind of bombarded with emails, uh, one of the actions we did take on the uh, the website, we do have a email specifically for any public inquiries on this, which is the moss ball response at fishandwildlife.gov. Um, that we will continue to monitor um, until I think we just really see a die down um, of the emails coming in. Um, I will say most of the emails we've received so far are along the lines of, I purchased a moss ball on this date, do I need to get rid of it? Um, I think that's been the majority of it, but again, it's something I'm sure we'll keep live until uh, we have this situation kind of at a level we don't think it needs monitored any longer. Great. Um, let's see. I see a comment. Um, okay, first I'll do the question and then I'll do the comment. So um, Anthony um, asks, did the pet store employee get a bonus or a public kudos? And I have my own answer to that, but Susan? <laughs> Yes, um, well, I actually, I was not present, so I don't know if anyone who was present um, would like to chime in as far as, you know, the process, um, but they did receive a recognition as part of National Invasive Species Awareness Week. Um, I believe there was a letter of appreciation that was signed by leadership of several of our key agencies and presented her, I'm sure, with a very nice thank you speech, but if anyone was present, I unfortunately was not, would like to chime in as far as what was said in the format. Um, I'd love to turn over the answer to that question. I don't see anyone that's provided feedback there, but I, to add to that, so right, the, the those were, that was an acknowledgement from the federal agencies. Um, that Susan mentioned, but Invasive Species Action Network, as you guys know, manages the Don't Let It Loose program. And we also gave her an award during National Invasive Species Awareness Week just to acknowledge her efforts as well. And we called it our Conscien Conscientious Conservation Award. So that was a first for us, but um, she accepted it graciously. So, um, Okay, so let's see. I do have another question here. Has anyone from Mark Sitzma, has anyone reported an infestation of adults in an aquarium as a result of the introduction of moss balls? And I guess if various people have feedback, you can provide that. Susan, are, do you have any knowledge of that? Was the question, I'm sorry, an infestation in an aquarium? Correct. Sorry, I'm thinking I do not believe so. Um, if anyone else has heard any reports, I have not heard anything. Okay. Um, Alan, do you, I'm going to unmute you to make your comment if I can find you. Alan, if you want to unmute yourself, you can make your comment. I just wanted to uh, let people know that Washington State, through our Department of Agriculture, is uh, in the process of uh, conducting rulemaking to establish a quarantine on moss balls. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, back to that question of the possible infested aquarium. Nick from Idaho has reported they have not seen any of that yet in Idaho. Um, okay, so I do have another question here. So this is from Teresa Tome. Beyond moss balls, is USDA planning to look more broadly at wildlife hitchhiking on live plants and trade, both on the federal and state level? Susan, do you have any feedback there? Well, um, I, I think there has been a recognition that we, we certainly don't think that hitchhiking is limited to moss balls, um, which is why we really are kind of relying on the after action report to do more of a legislative review. Uh, so hopefully we will come up with some good recommendations, maybe to look at that pathway a bit more closely. Uh, so I would say it's definitely on our minds um, and something I would love to see move forward. Okay, I see no more questions. Do we have, if you have a question, feel free to put that in now um, for Susan or any other comments too, for that matter. It doesn't have to be a question. 
so I guess I could ask a question. Susan, you mentioned the, the report. Do you have a, a sense for the timing of that next piece for the Fish and Wildlife Service? Well, um, <laughs> I would say soon, but I know that's kind of a <laughs> generic answer. Um, so where we are is we are currently, uh, we do have a prevention proposal that is being um, submitted internally through Fish and Wildlife to try to get the funds to have a third party uh, conduct that interview and write that report. Um, we will have a decision on that hopefully within the next month. Um, from there, I would hope that uh, that report and the information would start to be compiled over the summer. Um, that said, we've already had uh, several calls already just to kind of brainstorm specific questions and specific areas we want to make sure are included in this report. So it is something that we are already starting to kind of lay the groundwork for. Um, but how quickly that happens, given that there is a lot of information, um, a lot of different levels and a lot of different um, agencies and programs to talk to, I can imagine it is going to take, you know, several months to actually compile that and draft that report. Okay, thanks for sharing that. Um, okay, I see no more questions or comments. So thank you very much, Susan, for joining us. I'm glad we could get you on. We kind of did a little <laughs> loop de loop there. So thank you. Um, and it looks like we go, when we look at our agenda here, we are going to go to a break. We're a tiny bit ahead of schedule, but that's okay. Give people a chance to catch up on some other stuff and just take a breather for um so we will come back at uh 10 45 pacific time so in roughly 45 minutes um if you see um i'm still sh i should be showing my agenda there and if you look at that break section there in yellow i have a note there that says go to menti.com and there's a couple of numbers so um, after the break here this afternoon or this morning still, um, Laura Robinson with the Upper Columbia United Tribes is going to be using kind of a neat polling system. It's called menti.com. So allow us to be interactive during her presentation. So it's really um, pretty neat, but all you need to do as a participant um, during her talk, you will go to menti and use that little code and we'll be able to see a poll in real time. So I will sh we will share that again later, but wanted to um, alert you guys to that, um, that you could do that over the break. So thank you for joining us for that uh, first session and we will see you back here in about uh, 40 minutes. So thank you everybody.
Hey, Laura Robinson, I just made you um, a panelist. If you want to just do a quick sound check and unmute, so you need to unmute yourself. Hi, hi Leah, can you hear me? I can, yes, perfect. Great. I will I will make you a presenter when the moment comes. <laughs> good. Thank you. Okay. Okay, great. Welcome back, everybody. Um, we have a few more presentations this after or this morning. Still, sorry, we're getting closer to the afternoon where I am. Um, I, if you are just joining us, which I know a couple of you have reached out to me, I just want to point out um, our second presentation here with um, Laura uh, Robinson from the Upper Columbia United Tribes is going to be using this cool survey tool. Um, so you, as participants, um, can uh, load that or should load that. So it's this menti.com website and then specific numbers there that will allow you to access um, the questions that we'll answer in real time in a little bit here. So she will show that later, but you can at a minimum uh, load up the menti.com in preparation. So, um... so here we go, legislative update. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Oops. There we go. All right, good. So um, it, this is the 117th Congress, and you probably remember from the past two Congresses, 115 and 116, there was the Recovering America's Wildlife Act. This has been reintroduced again by Debbie Dingell. From Michigan and I think it's Jeff Fortenberry from Nebraska. Um, this would kick a lot of money through Pittman Robertson to state fish and wildlife agencies and also tribes, and it would uh, it would include funding for invasive species um, as one of the categories where the funding could be spent. Uh, next, and I talked a little bit about this. Um, when we were talking about moss balls is um, S626. These are the Lacey Act Amendments of 2021. And what this would do is fill the regulatory gap created by the US ARC, uh, and that's the reptile keepers, the litigation against Sally Jewell and the Obama administration on interstate transport. Um, if you are interested in getting active in this or your agency is, um, NASMA currently has a letter supporting this bill. So contact Elizabeth Brown and you can sign on. So the NASMA Legislative Committee has been following this as we have very closely. Moving along, um, it's the biannual introduction of the Lake Tahoe Restoration Act and this helps support um, the Lake Tahoe Invasive Species Program uh, Dennis Abaglo, Tom Booz, and their uh, top of the line watercraft inspection program. Um, and now there's just some interesting bills we'll go through now. This is a bill, Republican bill from Cruz and Gomert on, uh, it's called Saving America's Vulnerable and Endangered Species Act or SAVES Act. Uh, wouldn't, wouldn't allow putting a non-native species um, on the threatened or endangered list. Next. Uh, 
Okay, so unlike the interesting part about Congress, this go around and with the, with the new administration is um, it, it's changed the types of legislation we're looking at. Um, and so the obviously climate change is talked about all the time now. And a few of these bills do include invasive species, which is good. And a few of these bills are big ticket items. Um, so at the top there, this is Nagus from uh, uh, Colorado, I hope I said his name right, and Coons, um, bipartisan bill. Um, and in this Climate Corps Act, they would, um, some of the projects could be targeted conservation efforts and eradication of invasive species. Uh, the next one down, 21st Century Conservation Corps Act, uh, widen from Oregon and the Goose. Uh, so that's Senate and House. Um, and again, uh, invasive species is mentioned, and this is this is good because when it comes to projects, uh, you know, the small watershed levels, maybe some of this uh, funding could trickle down. Um, just of interest for you, those of you that follow aquaculture and gen genetically engineered salmon, Don Young once again has introduced his genetically engineered salmon labeling act. Um, and this is the aqua advantage salmon. Um, it's that's raised in Indiana. Um, the wild salmon industry is not a big fan of this, this GMO product. Um, however, uh, aqua advantage has made some sales to Europe and to Brazil recently. So um, we're, we at the commission are interested in this just because it's a, um, a product of, of concern, especially to the Alaska delegation. Next, please. Um, another big one, this is the SAFE Act um, from, uh, from White House, Rhode Island, S1420. Um, again, the reason I put this in here and the reason we're following it is it does mention um, foreign foreign pests and invasive species, extreme weather, um, and a connection there. So again, these a lot of these bills have grant programs that if all passed, um, maybe through an infrastructure bill, but I'll talk about that in a sec, um, uh, maybe another avenue for funding for states, tribes, and others. Um, down below that, um, I put this HR 3326 in here from 11 from California um, to promote the development of renewable energy um, along with climate change, renewable energy, wind energy, windmills in the ocean are, um, are, are big points right now. Um, this particular bill's caught um, my attention because of the 25% deposited into a fund for sportsmen and conservation purposes. Um, so that's, uh, that's good. You remember when a lot of the oil and gas work, um, off the coast, all the drilling, a lot of that is taxed. And then those funds go into accounts that end up in, um, state agencies for, uh, conservation work. So this, this is the same type of thing that we're starting to see in the, um, renewable energy sector as well. Um, what happened this year is because Congress is divided um, probably more than usual. Um, there was, this was a joint bill in the last couple of last couple of legislative sessions uh, with Gosar um, going in with the Democrats, in this case, Levin. But this time, um, Gosar, uh, Levin didn't want to include Gosar, so Gosar introduced his own bill, which is pretty much the same as 3326, but um, we'll see. I just, I, I thought this would be of interest for you folks to look at just some of the inside politics of, uh, of DC. Next slide, please. So this is just, I apologize for the formatting on this one. Mm. So 
this is the Ocean Based Climate Solutions Act. It doesn't have a bill number yet. It just came out uh, from the chair of the Natural Resources Committee, Rob Grigliba. And you can see there's a $50 million um, uh, living shoreline project uh, grant fund. Um, and then also in this, under the section called Caught in the Sea, the secretary shall make grants for, and one of the things is for invasive species. And this could be for maybe Asian carp um, uh, or other fish, lionfish, you name it. So uh, that's kind of interesting. And then in the coastal science and, hang on, I'm getting my computers messing with me. Okay. Um, and this coastal science and uh, assessment portion of the bill, there's um, competitive grants. Um, and as you can read there, for evaluating potential outcomes associated with developing new commercial and recreational fishery, fishery resources, um, targeting invasive and range expanding species. So there's another portion of a bill that includes invasives. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, appropriations. Hillary talked about this a little bit um, yesterday. Um, yes, there's a nice increase in the Department of Interior budget, 16%. Um, I'm a, I have not looked at all the individual line items. The main reason being um, we're waiting for Congress to come out with um, it's appropriation bills. It usually starts in the House. House has been having hearings, I think Senate too. Um, kind of like in the Trump administration, we the president's budget would come out and it would cut everybody. But, you know, there were some significant cuts um, to, to natural resource programs and EPA, Interior, and NOAA. Um, not the case in the new budget, but uh, it's good to know that the president budget, budget's out there and it's not, it's robust for Interior and that um, what we'll probably see, and, and remember, through all of those Trump budgets, the, the overall spending went up every year, and that we, in an invasive species world, we made gains. So I think, you know, going into this year so far, we're in really good shape. Um, and we'll be following the appropriation bills from Congress as they come out. The infrastructure bill, if you've been reading, uh, they've been negotiating, uh, trying to do a bipartisan bill on this for, let's say, weeks. It's been months. There's a lot of stuff in there, and there is invasive species stuff in there. Right now, they're stuck, and they're going to, I think, go back to uh, another coalition to try to get this thing across the finish line. They may use budget reconciliation. I hope they don't. I don't like that process. I, I think they're close enough where they can get this done. And again, there are there is some invasive species stuff in there. Um, probably one of the least controversial uh, bills that's been uh, done, and we're lucky we hitched our wagon to it uh, over the past um, six years, seven, eight. It'll be eight years in 2022 is the Water Resources Development Act, where we've gotten our watercraft inspection, flowering rush, rapid response, monitoring money, and others. As you see, is it's more and more people are adding things to this in our for our invasives world. Um, so we should see this in 2022, and it's probably going to get passed again. Uh, again, we're fortunate this bipartisan bill, which we're just a tiny fraction of of the spending in this, but um, it, it we'll look at it in 2022. Uh, next. And if um, you want to see what bills are in play right now, which ones we're tracking, you go to westernaas.org backslash uh, regulations, and then scroll to the bottom, and there's an AAS legislative tracker that Robin Draheim uh, keeps up to date on. We will also, in the AAS news, there's a legislative section in there. The next one's coming out in two weeks. Um, so we'll keep going with that um, and you can always contact Robin or myself if you've got questions and that's all I've got thank you and thank you for your patience my computer woes question for Stephen
comments for Stephen? <laughs> I see none so far. He's wearing his moss ball mask. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Well, seeing no question. Okay, here we go. We have a question. Mark Sitzma is asking what sort of items are in the infrastructure section? Um, what it, again, what I've seen is, Mark, good question, is that some of those bills that I showed earlier on um, the Climate Core, Conservation Core, and um, putting funding into working on invasive species, I think a lot of those bills that you saw early, earlier in my presentations, those are the types of things that could end up in the infrastructure bill. Um, or if there's an, another uh, version three of a COVID relief bill, um, they may wrap they may wrap that in there as well. So it's a wait. What I've been waiting for, we've been waiting for, is is to actually see the full bill because there's all these pieces out there. So we'll keep on top of it. Okay. Um, I don't see any more questions for Stephen. Okay. All right, so now we are going to, so thanks, Stephen. We're gonna to shift to our next presenter, Laura Robinson with the Upper Columbia United Tribes, who's gonna be talking about some work that they have been undertaking related to Northern Pike. So let me just, switch the control panels. So Laura, we can see the agenda on your screen. There you are. Hi. Hi. <laughs> can you see my uh, yeah. presentation? Yes, looks okay. great. And we can and see you. Perfect. Okay. And it's in presentation mode, I'm assuming? Yes. Okay. Yep. That's great. And I did put into the chat, folks, um, I did put the website and the code, as long as that hasn't changed since the last time we talked. So, nope, that should um, work. All right, great. Well, welcome, Laura, and take it away. Great, thanks. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Laura Robinson, and I'm the policy analyst for the Upper Columbia United Tribes. Uh, Leah and everyone, thank you for the invite to come speak to you all again about um, Northern Pike and what's going on in the Upper Columbia. Um, we came and spoke to you at the December meeting and you heard an update on what the Yukut tribes are doing with Northern Pike. And with this presentation, I'd like to actually talk about an effort that we've started since the last time we spoke to you, and that's the Regional Pike Forum. Um, it's really a multi-entity group of policy and technical folks getting together to discuss what the next steps are for Northern Pike. Um, I know that you guys have all heard so many presentations from the UCUT organization and its member tribes on Northern Pike. So I thought, um, why don't we talk, go through a brief update on this regional Pike Forum? And then given that you all have so much experience in aquatic invasive species, I'm gonna switch over to an online polling system that Leah's um, talked about with you guys, menti.com. And I'm gonna try and gather as much knowledge from you all that I can, that we can then apply to the efforts we're um, undertaking with the Regional Pike Forum. So before we jump into the Regional Pike Forum, just a quick update, very brief on Northern Pike and the Upper Columbia. So as you know, four of the five Yukut tribes actively monitor and suppress Northern Pike. And um, the photo on the left is a recent photo from this spring. The Coeur d'Alene tribe caught that large Northern Pike in Lake Coeur d'Alene, and it's actually the state record for the largest Northern Pike caught in Idaho. That Northern Pike is 49 inches long and over 43 pounds. Previously, Northern Pike experts understood that uh, a Northern Pike could produce 250,000 eggs. And this Northern Pike, the Coeur d'Alene tribe estimates had 400,000 eggs in it. So very glad that that got out of the water. 
So, um, you know, the Yukut tribe has been working on this issue for a very long time, and really they understand the threat that this fish poses, not only to their waters up here, but also to the rest of the waters in the Columbia River Basin. And so the Yukut tribes have been really interested in um, gathering folks around the basin to discuss, you know, the increased awareness on the issue of Northern Pike, the threats they pose, and uh, identify individuals and entities who can all work together to further the work, to prevent the spread of Northern Pike, and to together create some implementable and collaborative steps. So in 2018, the UCUT tribes hosted a regional pike forum. That's the photo on the left, back when we could meet in person and things were normal. Um, and there were about 21, 22 folks who came who worked mostly in the Upper Columbia or very close to where Northern Pike could be spreading to next. So folks from the Upper Columbia tribes, um, the mid CPUDs, WDFW, those type of folks joined for that meeting. And they really assessed where things are at and where things need to go from there. Um, then there was every intention to hold another Pike Forum in the spring of 2020, but COVID hit. So that was canceled or postponed. And we were finally able to have it at the beginning of 2021. We did that virtually. That's the other photo on the right that you can see. Um, it was different, but we had 116 attendees. And while I was concerned that maybe doing a virtual uh, meeting wouldn't get as much participation, we were actually really pleased to see so many people join and um, be very engaged in this topic. We had um, folks from eight tribes and First Nations, three tribal organizations, 10 state agencies representing six different states, six federal agencies, 11 regional organizations, and 12 Canadian agencies. And I just don't think that all those folks would have been able to travel to Spokane to have that conversation. So it was actually beneficial that we had it virtual in some ways. So the 2021 forum had four main purposes. The first was really to draw attention to the urgent risk of Northern Pike, um, to share information about that risk, what we know about Northern Pike, and what can be done to minimize their spread. Um, highlight uh, policy level opportunities and challenges and really work towards a coordinated regional policy response. And finally, working all together, um, really mobilizing this group of people who uh, feel passionately about this issue and getting technical policy and education outreach folks together to further the issue. So we use this interactive platform that we'll use in a minute called Mentimeter. Uh, we used it before, during, and after the meeting to poll folks and survey responses. And um, this is just a couple examples of some stuff we saw in the meeting. Um, you'll see the one on the bottom left. Uh, attendees would prioritize um, really all of the different spheres that are needed to be worked on right now. Um, policy and leadership, expanding technical information, and also increasing education and outreach. However, um, if they were going to choose just one, you'd see on the far left, policy, leadership, and coordination was the main area that folks <clears throat> see needs to be expanded right now. So the intent for this regional Pike Forum is to meet regularly, uh, probably around every 12 to 18 months, but then having three smaller work groups um, that will cover technical issues, education and outreach, and policy planning. Uh, we think that these small work groups can really take uh, more collaborative and actionable step, steps together based on their topic. And then, you know, every year, year and a half, meet together as the larger forum, retouch base, and reconsider what needs to happen next. So we, ha um, we had our first meeting with of the technical work group in April, and we're planning to have a second meeting either this month or early next month. We will be having a policy planning meeting soon after that. We're still planning that one out, but we're also planning to do that early this summer. And then likely an education and outreach work group meeting will happen sometime this summer as well. Um, so our April technical meeting, our purposes in getting together there this first time was to identify the existing technical resources and strategies available for Northern Pike. Um, review that technical information and the resources, and then see where there are needs and gaps that we can address, and then set up some short and long-term next steps, actions that this group can take and prioritize them. So we started by asking the group, 
what their first priority should be. And there were three different options. One was to develop a regional management and or a rapid response plan. One was to compile technical resources into one main online hub. And one was to develop training materials and tools. Um, as we worked through this information and really examined it from various angles and got everyone participating in the um, conversation, we split this up into actually four different priorities and we prioritized them. So the number one priority that this group identified is to develop an information sharing hub. So this is, we're working on this right now and we're gathering annual reports, management plans, um, maps, photos, anything that folks um, could use to help as they uh, plan for suppression and monitoring of Northern Pike or just become educated on Northern Pike. We're gathering all that information now as a group and soon it should be posted online. The Upper Columbia Salmon Recovery Board is offered to post this online. UCUT will probably have it online and we might find a couple other places on the World Wide Web to put this. Um, we feel it's important to have it be very accessible to folks, but um, this should be out sometime this summer and we'll definitely let um, this uh, team know when it's ready. The second is to develop a regional management plan. So in our conversations, we really realized that a regional management plan and a rapid response plan different things. So um, folks thought that developing a regional management plan was more of a priority. We are still working on the scope, but we see it as being more, um, maybe it's a state, a, one specific state or two states or part of Canada and part of the US, or but a larger scope um, of areas that already have non-native Northern Pike and need to be working together on consistent management practices to ensure that they do not spread. Um, the third priority was then to provide information on localized rapid response plans. So particularly for the anadromous zone of the Columbia River Basin, making sure that those folks have the information they need from the experts who have already been working on Northern Pike so that they can develop rapid response plans specific to their location. And then the fourth is to compile and develop training materials. So again, for the folks who have all the knowledge in working on this. Um, they're very interested in sharing that knowledge and the folks who need that knowledge really want it. So how can we harness that information and get it out to the broader public? So at this point, we'd like, I'd like to transition into the survey portion of this presentation. And so if you can go to menti.com and log in, I'll get it up on the website in just a minute or up on the presentation in just a minute. But um, I'm going to ask you a few questions that are specific to aquatic invasive species and also northern pike. And I understand that you all have, you know, broad range of experience with invasive species. And so if you could answer these questions in a way that really applies to like what you know, that would be really helpful for us. And we're going to take in the information that you share with us and apply it to our planning process. So Let's see. Leah, can you see the mentee on my screen right now? Yes, I see the word cloud. Okay, great. Yep. So um, if you haven't logged in, it looks like many of you have, so thank you. Um, but if you need to go to menti.com and the code's up on the top to log in. But this is just the first question, I'm really curious how when you learn about a new aquatic invasive species in the area that you manage and work in, how do you learn about that? What is the first source information that is sent to you? Is it a colleague? Is it some kind of, you know, listserv online newsletter? Is it, um, you know, Facebook, social media, the news, whatever. We're just really curious how people are getting this information um, shared. And I really appreciate you all participating. Um, it's interesting to see what folks are putting in. It looks like a lot of collaboration, communication amongst all the experts. Word of mouth, coordination, email, it's a big one. And Leah, um, Roughly how many folks are on the call? I'm not, I want to make sure I don't cut any folks off. We have 17 we, people responded. We have 15, or sorry, 50, five zero attendees. Okay. So I'll give this a another minute. Yeah. Um, 
yeah, participants do this. It's it's pretty savvy. I I actually think this is an amazingly powerful tool. So, yeah. and maybe do like a little split screen so you can still see Laura and you know go to the website. Yeah, this is great. This isn't hugely surprising um, responses, but it's really um, affirming. You know, it helps helps us all better understand uh, how how this information is shared. So, if you have any final responses, people are still putting in responses. How do you learn about a new AIS threat when one comes into your area? Who tells you? How do you find out? And this will tee up the, the next question that we have that's still about kind of what you do right when a new aquatic invasive species is in your area. Looks like email is really the popular one. I wonder if it was also that way um, during non-COVID times when we could walk down the hall to people. Okay, so we got about 25 responses. That's excellent, 26. Um, but it's starting to slow down, so I think I'll probably move on to the next question. Yeah. Okay, so the next question is um, a prioritization ranking question. So if you found a new aquatic invasive species in your area, whether you actually found it with your hands, your eyes, or if somebody alerted you to it, um, prioritize these five actions that you would take. Um, they're jumbled around right now. I'm just really curious um, what everyone thinks, you know, how, what your first few steps are that you would take. If you can um, prioritize all five, that would be really helpful. We have um, post to social media and share with local media outlets, fishing blogs, et cetera. Contact your state or regional invasive species council. Confirm um, the de detection and the extent of the introduction alert the next manager um, or contact your local office for the state fish and wildlife fishing game and you know as our group is working to develop and help assist in developing regional response plans for the anadromous area and other folks who aren't quite dealing with northern pike yet but preparing for it this kind of information is really helpful That's great. We really appreciate you guys all um, engaging in this because I know that you all have experience for the most part in doing rapid response. I mean, a lot of you just did it with the moss balls. And so um, this is really helpful. Okay, so we got 23 responses, 24 responses on that one now, just pretty close to what we got in the last one. So I'll probably shift to the next question, unless somebody else has put anything in right now. Okay, so then the next question, um, we're actually, so these last couple of questions have been really about aquatic invasive species overall. And the next two questions are gonna be specific to Northern Pike. Um, so there are four statements on the slide right now, and I wanna know how much you agree or disagree with each statement. If you can do all four, that would be really helpful. So there's the Columbia Basin needs a coordinated policy and management approach to invasive Northern Pike. The anadromous waters of the Columbia Basin need localized rapid response plans. The managers of the Columbia Basin need to coordinate messaging about Northern Pike. And folks working and fishing in the anadromous zone, they know what to do and what to look for for Northern Pike. And when they catch one, they know what to do. So how uh, much do you agree with, with these statements?
So this is great. Um, this is really consistent with some of the stuff we've talked about, the Regional Pike Forum and the technical group. Those top three are really important to folks. It's really important to the region. And the bottom one, you know, we're not we're not really sure completely how much people know what to do in the anadromous zone. So it looks like maybe folks know relatively well, but maybe some more outreach and education could um, occur in the anadromous zone to ready people for if slash when Northern Pike arrive. So great, we got 27 responses on that one. That's excellent. So the next question is actually going to pretty much take these four and I'm gonna ask you to prioritize them. So again, this is specifically for Northern Pike. There are four tasks there. What, what's the first, second, third, and fourth that we should be tackling here? A basin-wide coordinated public outreach plan and messaging, a coordinated comprehensive regional management plan, technical education and field work experience to prepare for response to Northern Pike expansion, and then four localized rapid response plans for the anadromous waters of the basin. What's the first thing we should do as a, as a forum, as a region? That's the second thing, third and fourth. Leah, are we doing okay on time? I have two more questions if we have time. I think we have time. We, you know, because we started late, I, I hope we're, I think we're okay. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, this also is really con quite consistent with what our technical working group is saying are the priorities. And it's really helpful to see that the folks who have worked on regional management plans on other aquatic invasive species are really seeing that that's an important part for Northern Pike um, in the basin. Um, okay, so then our last two questions are gonna go back to being aquatic invasive species broad focus. Really wanna take whatever knowledge information that you have that you can share with us. So um, the first question of these last two is, what are the core elements that the UCAT tribes and their partners must include in the development of a regional management plan? for Northern Pike or for an aquatic invasive species. So many of you have worked on regional management plans, you've helped develop them, you've helped implement them, you've tracked them, you've read them, et cetera. Um, what, is, what are the core elements, whether it's specific steps that need to be in um, a management plan, specific chapters, very specific topics, um, what are those core elements for a regional management plan? And this one's just open-ended. People's answers will just show up and we'll be able to take this all back to the forum and the work group and apply it. Communications tree, rapid response planning, compre comprehensive early detection and monitoring program, early detection, regulatory compliance, identification of the primary players with authority and engage all of them, get buy-in from all relevant management entities, monitoring program and response plan, the right stakeholders and public buy-in, that's a good one, public buy-in, um, survey to detect new invasions, primary agencies involved, funding, can't quite see the bottom of that one. Consistent standardized early detection monitoring protocols. We've talked about some of that in, in our work group. Resources list, this is great. Criteria for education, monitoring, public response. Consistent messaging. Yeah, we're really getting the, the vibe that our regional management plan will need to have um, you know, really outreach and education pieces, policy pieces, technical pieces, and there'll need to be consistency. And so that's really helpful. Great, so we have about 26 answers here, which is about consistent with the other questions, 27 now. So um, we'll move to that final question, which is 
based on your experience with aquatic invasive species, if there is one thing that the Yukut tribes and their regional partners must consider in any of this large scale action and planning within the forum, with the management plan, et cetera, what is that one thing that we have to know? What is that lesson that you learned that you're like, don't go down that road or you must go down this road? And this is again will just be open answers um, your answers will just show up on the screen and we'll bring it into the work we're doing public buy-in that was um, definitely a topic of conversation at the forum and also at the work group practice communication and coordination with federal and state partners before there is an emergency like some of the work that you've been doing for the um, muscles um yep get partners and decision makers to the table at the beginning of the planning process that's what we're trying to do with the forum so that's yeah really good the public must be involved as having the largest role in response and mitigation okay yeah really get that ownership political and public support the plan will change when executives and politicians get involved good to know majority of regional support good lines of communication with multiple agencies move quickly make decisions quickly act quickly so true with northern pike and aquatic invasives generally yep so that's why it's good to have that plan out so that then we can just quickly act awesome so i'll leave this up for a second um but i have in my presentation i'm not sure if leah is going to send it out but um, on my last slide is my contact information. If anyone has any further information to share to help with our planning, you know, we definitely are all ears. And if you want to be more engaged in the Pike Forum and you haven't been, let me know. We'll get you involved. Um, also, as you know, the work up here has been woefully underfunded. And the more attention that this gets up here, the more boats and nets on the water, the more funds and awareness that's um, provided up here, the slower that those fish will end up in the anadromous zone, the further out that, that will happen. So um, if you have any help in getting the Yukut tribes more um, connected to funding sources for this, it will only benefit the whole basin. So um, with that, thank, thank you all for your input on this. We're gonna bring it into our planning process and it, I know it's gonna be really beneficial. So um, if I don't know if there's time, but I can take questions if there is, Leah. Right, yeah, if, if anybody has a question for Laura, now is your moment. You're getting a high five for doing the interactive presentation, Laura, so that's good. <laughs> yeah, this Menti tool is really powerful. Yeah, I really, I really appreciate everyone engaging on that. That's cool. Yeah. Um, I don't see any questions yet, but... Um, yeah, if you reach out to me, if you um, don't have Laura's contact, I can make sure that you get connected. So, um, okay, I'm still, I haven't seen anything come in yet. So thank you so much for joining us and sharing. And I'm sure we'll be <laughs> reaching back out to you again from the CRB to, to get some progress updates on where things are headed. So, so thank happy. you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, wonderful. All right, so now we are going to um, do a couple of, we missed a partner update yesterday due to a conflict. So we're gonna have Montana Fish, Wild and Parks. Zach Crete is going to give us a little update on things going on in Montana. And there is Mr. Zach. <laughs> awesome. Okay. If you take it away, Zach, if you want to share what, what's happening in Montana. Awesome, thank you. Um, I'm Zach Creed. I'm the Prevention Coordinator for Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, uh, AIS Bureau. Uh, this will be this is going to be pretty quick, but I'm happy to take questions if anybody has any. Just kind of run down on some numbers. We're uh, sitting about 24,000 inspections and 27 muscle boats this year, which uh, 
we're getting close to last year's numbers on muscle boats and we're almost almost identical to the number of inspections we had during covid last year so it'll be interesting to see how the season plays out now that memorial uh weekend has passed and it's full on and uh stations are getting busier and busier um some of the stuff that went good too this year to note um you know we had some uh decreases in covid restrictions which allowed us to train a couple stations at a time which really helped with staff uh, and time and kind of controlling that burnout a little bit from having to to um, train every single station one one at a time so that helped too with the covid and then we got montana where uh, the masks were rescinded and so that helps with inspectors on the ground when it's getting hot here now um, for those folks too um, folks are coming back into the office so as a team we're we're getting uh, more connected you know I, I mean we we were connected you know during covid too but now most of us are in the office and so that that always helps out when we can just walk you know 10 feet and talk to folks um the couple of things that we have going on uh that this year was we we have the new data application from colorado which allows for emailing receipts and also printing so we've started to put some printers on the landscape and that is working out good uh, we'll see how that plays out as time goes on with road dust and stuff like that and if that starts to gum up printers but we are printing receipts at places and we're going to move to doing that more and more uh, and we have been emailing receipts so that's really nice too because um, as you know I'm sure everybody here knows when you put stuff into the data tablet and then you have to go and grab the paperwork and essentially do it again it, it holds up folks so as a customer service tool uh, emailing and printing receipts is is really nice and it helps to uh, doesn't doesn't speed up the process a ton but when you look at a couple hundred thousand inspections if you can save a minute here or two minutes there um, with that process it certainly does help um, one thing that that can is continue to happen in here in montana and i know tom wolf our bureau chief is going to be speaking on this uh in a in a meeting here coming up but we still are getting quite a few commercial transports of boats that are muscle fouled uh, uh and and equipment too you know barges and such uh that are that have bissel threads and some evidence of muscles on it so uh that continues to be a challenge that 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 we're addressing and by we mostly mostly tom is working with the midwest states and and what we can do to kind of help uh, curb this a little bit uh with folks um but uh, uh otherwise things are going really good the season's up and running uh we have faced um this year some considerable challenges concerning staffing. Uh, I mean, we're recruiting like crazy. We did end up going to uh, a temp, temp services uh, agency uh, that we are utilizing temporary staff from uh, folks that just supply people to go to work that's not hired directly through the agency. And we're doing that right now for three stations uh and recruiting i mean we, we've been recruiting and we'll get like one or two people and you know some of them are from you know for example at our dylan station we had somebody applied from arkansas you know and so the recruiting is tough and staffing is tough and, I, and it's i know it's not just us it's across the country i mean most of the most of the businesses here in helena have signs out you know now hiring so um we're we're getting it covered. We're we're utilizing on-call staff from stations all across the state and moving them to locations to work. Um, we are using the temp agency now, and hopefully through our recruiting process here in the next six weeks, we can go ahead and get them back to staffed with FWP staff. But um, that has been a significant challenge for us too. So um, that's really the highlights that I have for right now. If if there's any questions. Uh, I apologize if that was a little short for folks, uh, but if there are any questions, uh, go ahead and hit me up. Are there any questions for Zach about Montana? Oops, I'm not seeing any here. 
guess you're off the hook, Zach. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Well, good luck out there. Um, yeah. Awesome. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. So, um, Mark has obviously followed the uh, invasive species programs, watercraft inspection, aquatic plants for I mean, it's like 25 plus years now. So he had a question regarding a percentage of boats inspected that are infested at the different states. So he wanted to talk about this a little bit. And Mark, I'm going to turn it over to you. So go ahead and pose your uh, question. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. I <clears throat> was just looking at the data that Stephen provides, and this graph sort of shows the percent of boats that are inspected that are in infested by state and by year. And what jumped out at me is that Oregon and Washington, the trends are fairly consistent year to year, but Oregon and Washington seem to have a higher percent of boats inspected. Now, the numbers are small across the board, but still it's consistent. And I asked myself, why would Washington and Oregon have a higher percentage of boats infested? You would think they would be lower because boats are coming 